I have a tendency to complete one project and then immediately realize that I've created a new problem in the process. Luckily, this bench should add some comfort rather than issues because sometimes it's nice to just take a seat. But until then, let's get working on Timber Biscuit. So as I said in the opening, today I'm gonna to be building a bench. And I designed this bench to complement the dining table that I built in the last episode. The new table meant that I needed some new seating, hence the problem. But that's not to say this bench has to be used with a dining table. It could easily be placed in an entryway or hall or at the end of a bed. I mean, after all, it's a bench. So what you see me doing here is breaking down my lumber. Since I used this same walnut lumber in the previous build, I don't have to plane anything down because I already have some leftover boards from the dining table that are thickness down to an inch and a half. And if I'm being honest, not having to mill anything down at the start of the build is kind of nice. And with that last rip cut, I have all my pieces cut down to their rough width. So let's take a moment and check out the design. So as I mentioned, the design for this bench is heavily inspired by the design of the dining table and that it's gonna have these nice exposed legs that run up the sides. And it also plays off the dining table's X or Y style base, only this time you can actually see it. The top of the legs are offset slightly to wrap around the cushioned seat, which again, complements the dining table, but we'll dive more into those details when we get there. So for now, the next step was to cut all my pieces down to their rough length. And to do that, I'm gonna pop in my crosscut blade and turn to my miter gauge. In the last episode, I asked you guys whether you use a miter gauge or sled more, and it was pretty much a toss up between the two. But here, I'm gonna be using my miter gauge because I feel like I can dial in those cuts a little bit better than I can with my sled. I also like using a miter gauge with a flip down stop because I can cut my first end square and then flip it around, drop down the stop, and cut it to its final length. This just cuts down on the number of times that I have to reset during the process, and it also ensures that all my cuts are exactly the same. But because I move my miter gauge from the left side to the right side of my saw pretty often, I always use a rule to check my settings. Kind of like a group of woodworkers on a cruise. You know, it's great craftsmanship. So the next step was to start cutting in the miters for those bench legs. And to set up my miter gauge, I'm just going to use my template. All I have to do is set up the angle so that it matches my blade width marking on the top of my table saw. Then from there, I can just lock the stop and make the cut. And as a side note, to make those, all you have to do is use a straight edge on the edge of your blade, and then use a utility knife to carve those into the top of your saw. They're really helpful for cuts like this, and I use them all the time. So once I had the lower miters cut in, I could flip the piece around and cut the miters for the top. Again, using those markings to align everything. Now because the angle is so steep here, I did use a clamp to hold my workpiece against the fence, which keeps my fingers out of the way and ensures the workpiece doesn't move during the cut. With this type of cut, the biggest thing to be mindful of is just to stay clear of that blade. And that's simple to do as long as you keep your hand on the miter gauge handle. There's a lot of blade exposed for this type of cut, so stay clear. Next, it was time to make the sled for my tapers. Now, I've shown how I build sleds in other videos, so I'm not going to dive into all the details. Instead, we're just going to speed through it here. So all I do is mark out my positioning, and then screw down some setup blocks, and attach hold down clamps on top. Since the width of my sled is set by my table saw's fence, I won't touch the fence again until all my tapers are cut. From there, all I have to do is pop on my workpiece in the correct orientation and make the cuts. Now, whenever you're cutting tapers, it's always a good idea to keep your body on the same side as your sled and away from the off cut. And that's because when you're cutting tapers, there's a higher risk for kickback. So it's best to use a zero clearance rope plate if you can, so that the workpiece doesn't wedge itself in between the plate and the saw blade. But either way, just take your time and your tapers should look great. So next up it's time to cut the curved transitions in the lower base pieces. And to mark those out, I'll again just use a template. Once I have the markings on the work pieces, I'll take them over to the bandsaw and cut them out. Now here I'm aiming for my work pieces to be about a 16th to an eighth of an inch over my actual width. And that's because the bandsaw blade will leave light ridges in the work piece that aren't perfectly smooth. So I wanna leave a little wiggle room for me to sand and plane back to you later on. And then from there, all I have to do is rotate the workpiece around and cut in the curve. Again, staying about a 16th of an inch away from my line. And with some practice, these types of cuts become really familiar and a lot less intimidating, which gives me plenty of time to think about the bigger picture. Like, the youngest picture of you is also the oldest picture of you. Yep, those are bandsaw thoughts. So now with all my workpieces cut out, I could go ahead and get started on the joinery. And to do that, I first needed to set my blade to 45 degrees. Then from there, I could mark out all the final lengths for those mitered angles. Now, just like the table, there's gonna be two different angles that need to be cut here at different lengths, but both are going to be 45 degrees. And that's again because the joinery is going to pivot at the center, making a Y or X shape. 
So the outside miter angle is going to be longer than the inside miter angle. And that's because we want that inside mitered angle to be the exact width of the thickness of the stretcher. So there's a little math that goes on to get me there. But in reality, as long as all my pieces are the same, even if they're off by a hair, they're all going to be off by a hair. So there'll be some consistency there for me to work with. And I'd say that's the biggest difference in the joinery between this bench and the table, because in the table, if the base was off at all, the top wouldn't drop in place. Whereas here, I can cut the bench top to whatever length I need it later so that it fits correctly. Oh, and since I'm talking about the measurements, if you guys want plans for this project, just let me know down in the comments. And as always, if there's enough interest, I'll put them together. So the last pieces to get cut down to their final length are my two stretchers, and I'm just going to do that by using a stop block and, again, my miter gauge. This is another situation where a clamp helps out greatly to make sure all my pieces are exactly the same and that the workpiece doesn't move during the cut. So to hold these pieces together, I'm going to be using dominoes. So the next step is to go ahead and lay out all that domino joinery. Now, as always, if you're looking to build a piece like this and you don't own a domino, you could always replace the domino joinery with dowels. And while I wrap that up, let me take a quick second to say that if you guys are enjoying this video, please give it a like. It allows the video to spread to more people, and I greatly appreciate your support. Alright, so with all the joints laid out, I could get to plunging the mortises. Now, there's a couple different heights I have to work with in the joinery, and that's just because of how the joints are cut and where they live. So here I was really mindful to label all my joints with the different depths and their orientations. I think that's probably where most people get in trouble when they're using a domino. In practice, using a domino is super easy. All you have to do is plunge your mortises. But it's only super easy if you take the time to mark out and lay out your joinery correctly. Otherwise, you're going to end up with a bunch of loose tenons that are actually loose, which I understand is a bit conflicting given the fact that you want the loose tenons to be somewhat tight. So maybe we should advocate for tight tenons. I don't know. I guess I'm just a sucker for well-fitting joinery. We all have our vices. Mine are just attached to the bench. So with all the mortises cut, I could do my first dry assembly to see how everything was coming together. And yeah, I say we're looking good. Next, I headed over to the bandsaw to cut out some clamping blocks. Because of the unique angles on the miter joints, as well as the back of the legs, I needed to create some blocks that were going to hold everything square. So these guys will complement those angles, making the glue up a lot easier. So I decided to break this piece down to a few different glue ups. The first of which is to glue the bottom angled stretcher onto the base of the leg. So here I'll utilize both those blocks I just cut out to make it happen. Now for all the glue ups on this piece, I'm gonna be using Type Bond 2 Dark. And that's because it's a darker wood glue that I find really helps to hide the glue line with walnut. Now obviously there's a change in grain pattern here, so you're gonna see the joint regardless, but I really like using the darker glue for the darker lumbers. Once I have a decent amount applied to the mortises and the end grain, I can apply some clamping pressure. From there I could head over to the router table and pop in my pattern bit and set the height. Here I'm aiming for that top edge of the bearing to ride just below the top edge of my template. And that's because there's a small gap between the bearing and the cutter head and I want to make sure I account for that. Next I can use some double sided tape to attach my templates to my workpiece and then fire up the router and get to cutting. Here I'm not actually looking to follow my templates entirely, rather I'm just looking to finish that curve. There may be a small amount of material that's removed from the side, but like a short mother, that's a minimum. Then from there, I can just pop off the template, raise up that bit a bit, and finish the cut. And hey, if you're enjoying this build a bit, make sure you subscribe. I put out new videos about woodworking projects with tips and tricks all the time, so subscribe so you don't miss the next one. Alright, from there it was over to the oscillating spindle sander to clean up that transition. Here I'm not trying to sand too much away, I just want to kiss that edge. If I go too deep here, it'll leave a bit of an indentation on the leg where the spindle sander meets that transition. So real light passes here. From there it was time to start cleaning up these boards. And the first thing I'll do is fill in any knots or voids with some black CA glue. I like to hop back and forth between black and dark brown for walnut just because it has a more natural look. And that's the big benefit of using dyed CA glues. And with the knots all filled in, I could go ahead and use my hand planes to dimension these pieces to their final thickness and remove those saw marks. Now, because these pieces are going to live separate from one another, I don't have to worry too much about not changing that outside angle. So here, I just plane my pieces down until they're as smooth as I can get them. And of course, it goes without saying, make sure you go with the grain whenever you're using a hand plane. Otherwise, you'll get a bunch of tear out and nobody wants that. Smooth. From there, I could go ahead and break all the hard edges with the sanding block and really finesse that transition. 
Here I was just careful to avoid any of the areas where my two joints were going to meet up. This way I don't risk rounding over any of those parts or adjusting the angles where the two joints connect. Then from there it was on to the second glue up. And this glue up goes pretty much like it did on the first glue up, only this time I don't need to use any special clamping blocks on the leg side. And that's because the taper isn't so extreme that I can't get a good hold on it with just a parallel clamp. So once I had the glue applied, I could pop in my wedge and apply some clamping pressure. Here I'm just careful not to go overboard or I risk splitting that wedge. Nice. Once those had dried fully, I could move on to assembling my two sides. In these situations, I really like to glue in my dominoes ahead of time. This way I don't have to finagle with them in the middle of the glue up. Smarter, not harder. And to make sure I got even clamping pressure, I just used some miter blocks on either side of the base. I find that these guys are really helpful if I'm gluing up miters at 45, or even gluing miters that are close to 45. I've gotten a lot of questions about them, so I'll leave a link to this set down in the description. Once the two sides had dried, I could go ahead and lock the pieces down to my bench and plunge in the mortises for that center stretcher. And since there's a glue seam in the center of the joint, I don't have to worry about marking anything out. All I have to do is align my domino with that glue joint and plunge the mortises. This makes centering those long stretchers super easy because I already have my indicator and I don't have to measure anything out. Kind of like when I cut that ocean in half. I use my seesaw. From there, it was on to the final glue up. Now, I've mentioned in the past that I always feel like glue ups are kind of nerve wracking. But I'm curious how you guys feel about your glue ups overall. So let me know down in the comments if you think glue ups are stressful or no sweat. And if you start your comment with no sweat or stressful, I'll reply to you guys first because as always, I know you're paying attention. So now that the base was assembled, I could go ahead and take the measurement from my bench seat and cut it down. For my bench seat, I'm going to be using Baltic birch plywood, but really any plywood would work. This is just what I had left over in the shop. So once I've trimmed everything down, I place it in the center of the base, making sure to leave a bit of a gap so that there's plenty of room for the fabric to wrap around. Then from there, it was on to some of those finishing touches. And while I wrap those up, let me take a quick second to say that if you guys are enjoying these videos and you want to support the channel, I'd like to invite you to join my Patreon. I just released a bunch of new tiers that include a ton of new perks, so if you haven't checked it out yet, be sure to check out the link down in the description. There's a lot of behind the scenes and conversations that happen beyond these videos, so if you're looking to improve your woodworking and get some extra tips along the way, give it a look. And to those of you who have already joined, thank you guys so much for your continued support. Your contributions go directly towards making these videos, so thank you. Alright, so for the finish on the bench, I'm using the same finish that I use on the table, which is going to be Rubio Monocoat. Again, I love Rubio Monocoat for its ease of application, its durability, and its repairability. And given that this bench is mostly going to be used by my six-year-old son, I'll afford it any protections I can give it. From there, it was on to the upholstery. Now, I don't usually go into detail on the upholstery, but I get a lot of questions about it in other videos, so I figured I'd cover it pretty quickly here. So once I've cut the padding and batting to their exact dimension, I use some spray adhesive to attach the batting to the pad, then trim off the excess at the corners. Then from there, I cut the fabric about four inches larger so that I have two inches of overhang on all sides of the bench. Next, I grab a staple gun and tack it in place. The trickiest part for this type of upholstery is just the corners. So here, I just take my time to make sure I get the exact look that I want and staple it in place. From there, I can trim away any excess fabric and work my way to a nice flat seam. It's just like when I asked my surgeon if I could do my own stitches. He said, suit yourself. From there, it was time to attach the base to the seat. And to do that, I'm just going to use some figure eight clips. I think figure eight fasteners are probably my favorite way to fasten tops to bases, even though I went with Z clips on the tabletop. And I went with Z clips because I felt like there was a lot more wood movement that could occur with the tabletop. Whereas here, since I'm working with plywood, I don't really have to worry about that. So figure eight fasteners for the win. From there, all that was left was to flip the bench over and check out those glamour shots. This bench turned out exactly as I envisioned. It has a ton of character without being too over the top. It has a really nice open design that allows for the space to feel less cluttered and more airy, even though it's built like a tank. I love showcasing those Y-shaped miters in the base, and I think overall it meshes really well with the dining table. And it'll be a workhorse for my son or whoever else wants to sit upon this throne. The repetition of the through legs is a really cool feature, and I think the mix of subtle curves and angles really make this piece stand out. And before you jump down my throat about the fabric, it is stain resistant, but with a six year old, we'll really be putting that to the test. I also really love the transitions in this piece. I tried to accentuate the grain pattern where I could and follow those lines through the form, which I think worked out. 
But if you enjoyed this project and you want to see more like it, make sure you check out this video next. Subscribe so you don't miss the next one. And as always, I knew this would work, and I'll see you next time.